tutorial, we're going to learn to make the shawl on the mannequin behind me. And we can cut away to another picture of this, showing it in its full glory. It's called the Arabella Shawl, and it's brought to us by Skano. Skano is an innovative and new yarn company with over 40 years combined textile experience. And they are really socially responsible, and I'm really happy to be working with them. They, uh, this yarn is a superwash merino, and it is spun in Italy, and it's dyed in Germany. And at the place where this yarn is dyed in Germany, it's called an inclusion company. And uh, that means that they they're set up to employ people with special needs, and, and currently 50% of the employees there have special needs, and they have a regular job, and they have a good salary, and I love working with companies that are responsible this way. Besides the fact that they make beautiful yarn, this is the yarn used in the shawl. This is the colorway um, that I chose in the shawl behind me. It's called Clematis, but there are over 30 different colorways to choose from, and I'll give you a link um, here on screen to my website where you'll find a link to the free pattern and to the, uh, the Skano website where you can see all of the different colorways. And the different colorways you saw in the still image, it's just barely those subtle changes of blue. And in the one that I chose, of course I picked the pink one, or one of the pink ones, kind of more dramatic color changes starting at gray and going to purple. Uh, really with as many colorways as there are, you're bound to find lots of them that you like. Um, yeah, I think that's everything we need. This is a, a fingering weight superwash merino. It is actually machine washable. That's what I did to mine and set it out flat to dry. It is about, uh, not about, I'd say it's an advanced beginner level. If you uh, can cast on, and you're confident with a knit stitch, I'm going to show you everything else here in this video. You won't have any more questions about it. So um, next up, we're going to talk about the construction of this shawl. And be sure to click the link to my website where you get all of the information about everything you need for this. And we'll get started on the construction. In this segment, we're going to talk about the construction of this shawl. Uh, I, I think there are two different kinds of knitters. There are people who like to just dive into a pattern and see where it takes them next. And there are people who like to understand what's coming up and how the whole thing's going to fit together. And this segment is for the people who like to understand how the whole thing's coming together. Uh, this uh, shawl is worked in a series of right triangles. And you finish a triangle and then switch colors and finish another triangle, switch colors, each color being, uh, each triangle being a different color. And they're all offset a little bit and it's worked using short rows, uh, short rows and wraps and turns. And before I go any further, I'm going to have to answer this question I think a couple times in this video because the question is going to be asked, can I substitute German short rows for regular wraps and turns? And the answer is yes, you can if you like, but there's really no reason to. The awesome thing about German short rows is that it makes picking up the wraps unnecessary. Uh, just the way they're worked, you don't have to look for a wrap to pick it up. But in this shawl, in this garter stitch shawl, there is no need to pick up wraps. So there's really no need to, to use German short rows unless you want the practice or whatever. You can't ruin it by doing sh German short rows. It's just there's really no need for it. So let's first um, take a look at how short rows end up making these right triangles. Okay, I have some graph paper here, and we're going to um, we're going to have each one of these squares represent a stitch. This is much narrower than the whole shawl, but you'll get the idea. And let me think of which direction I want to start. I want to start this way. So you cast on and knit a row, and that's using up all the stitches. And then you knit. You've cast on 156 stitches. You're going to knit 150 which is six, six, six stitches shy of the end of the work, and turn the work and knit all the way back to the end. And then knit six stitches shy of the last turn, and all the way back to the end. And you keep doing that, subtracting six stitches each time. And all these stitches are still live on the needle. You're just not knitting them. You're turning the work before you're finished. And you keep going with this. Whoops, I went almost all the way to the end. Um, but this is, 
This is just for example. You keep going with this until you have just six stitches left, and then you're done, and you end up with this right triangle. And um, then you work a lace row, and uh, you're done with that color. But this is how short rows work in making a right triangle. And now we'll take a look at how the different segments come to go together. Um, we'll say that this is your first right triangle, and each one fits together a bit offset from the one before it. Let me keep the colors alternating here. And the way this works, let me get these down. Isn't that pretty? It's a smart design. So this is the first triangle you used, you made with uh, the short rows. You knit all the way to the end, and then on the, um, on the next row in the new color, you cast on stitches here, and that's what makes the next one stick out a little bit more. Then you work the exact same triangle, and the next one you cast on stitches here, and that's how we get this stair-steppy thing. But the whole time, all of these stitches, oh well, as you move along, all of these stitches are live, and you're just not working them. It's kind of like the short rows. And then at the very end, you knit all of the stitches, all of the kind of the tips of the triangles back and forth for a garter stitch border. These are sliding around. Okay, you get it. And that's the garter stitch border here. Oh, one more thing I want to show you. This is a bulky example of, and, and a little bulky example of how the triangles come together. And this, this row right here with the holes is the lace row. And of course, I'll show you how to work that. Okay, that's how this whole thing comes together. Next, we're going to put yarn to needles and start with the cast on. We're actually ready to get started on the shawl now, and I'm looking over my notes for what I put together for this, and I think we can summarize this segment of the video as the how not to count so much <laughs> section, <laughs> because I try to simplify things. I'm going to show you my trick for casting on a whole bunch of stitches to make sure you have enough yarn and that you don't have to keep counting over and over again, and then I'm going to show you my trick for leapfrogging stitch markers so that you don't have to keep counting out 150, 144. Um, you can just knit up six stitches shy of the next marker. I'm going to show you all that right now. And the first thing I'll show you is how to cast on a whole bunch of stitches using um, the long tail cast on. And the first concern with the long tail cast on is that you have to leave enough yarn in the tail for the whole cast on because it's just heartbreaking when you're, say, 125 stitches into a cast on and you run out of yarn and you have to start all over again. And you're just excited to start the project and you don't want to cast on again. So I'm going to show you how to avoid that first. I recommend the knitted cast on or the long tail cast on for this project, a good sturdy cast on. Nothing fancy is necessary because we're working in garter stitch. Now, as always, I use bulkier yarn and much bigger needles for demonstration purposes. The, the yarn and needles used in the shawl is mu are much smaller and lighter than what I have here. Now, to make sure we have enough yarn for the whole cast on, you want to take your needles and your yarn and leaving like a six inch tail, start wrapping the needle and counting. And each one of these wraps is enough for one stitch. It's enough for one stitch. Um, you'll end up having a little bit extra yarn, but it's better to have extra yarn than not enough. And once you get up to either 25 or 50, it's up to you, or just a number that you can remember, this is what uh, you do. You mark that spot. So I know that this much, minus this little tail, is enough for um, 50. I fold it over, there's 100. I fold it over again, there's 150. So I can make a slip knot right there, knowing that I've left enough tail for um, 156 stitches. I marked out 150, but you always have a little extra, so the six, six stitches will fit in there. But I'm going to cast on far fewer than that for, um, uh, for the sample that I'm going to knit up for you, and I'm going to I'm going to walk you through an entire triangle, kind of an abbreviated triangle, but all the techniques used in the triangle. So let's go ahead and take a look. And this is my trick for casting on 
a whole bunch of stitches and not having to recount them a hundred times. So start casting on and counting. And the way that I do this is I count up to 50, either 25 or 50, depending on how distracting my environment is, I guess. Count up to 25 or 50, then double check and recount, and then take a marker, place it, and never count those again. And then cast on 25 or 50 again. And double, I'm obviously not doing it, double check your count to make sure you have 50 and place another marker and never count those again. And that's how um, I keep from losing track and starting over and over again. But I'm just going to cast on a few. And I'm doing the long tail cast on the way that I like to do it. I find that doing it this way gives me the best tension control. This is the other way to work the long tail cast on in the slingshot method. And I'll give you a link here to my video, um, a, slow tech, a slow demonstration of this cast on. Okay, I'm just going to try it with, I'm just going to do it with 24. I'm going to try it with 24. I'm pretty sure I can do it. So the first line of instructions tells us to knit across all of the stitches. And you're going to want a couple of stitch markers to do this technique I'm about to show you. A couple of clippy stitch markers. The kind that you can use like a ring marker but then also unclip and take off. And information on everything you see in this video, as usual, the yarn and the needles and the stitch markers and everything else is in the video description field below, as well as on my website. Okay, first line of instructions complete. And now, if I have 156 stitches here, the pattern tells me to knit 150. Just like I showed you on the paper, I'm going to knit uh, six stitches shy of the end of the work. Okay, where am I? Two, four, six, one more. And now I'm going to do a wrap and turn. And I'll have this all written out for you. Uh, really, wrap and turns are the same thing, um, but they can be written out in different ways. I like to work them so that I do most of the actions before I turn the work. But if, there's a, if you are comfortable working it another way, that's not a problem. That is fine. This is how I do it. Um, and I'll have this written out, and you'll see me do it a few more times. Yarn forward. Slip the stitch from the left needle to the right, yarn back, slip that same stitch back to the left needle, turn the work, pull the yarn back so we'll be ready to work a knit stitch, and then take a clippy marker and pop it on. And the marker is what, the markers are what is going to keep us from counting and counting and counting. Because I'd rather I'd rather watch, <laughs> watch Netflix than count. So I'll show you the tricks that I use. After we do that wrap and turn, I knit all the way to the end. Now the next line in the pattern tells me to knit 144 stitches, which is six shy of this last marker I placed. So I'm going to knit 144, but I'm not going to count. I'm just going to keep knitting until I get close to that marker. When I start feeling like I'm close to six, I'll count. And here I'm going to work the wrap and turn again. Yarn forward, slip a stitch from the left needle to the right, yarn back, 
slip that same stitch from the right needle to the left, turn the work, pull the yarn back so you're ready to start knitting again, and place a marker. And this is where the leapfrogging starts, the leapfrogging of markers. And then the pattern tells us to knit all the way to the end. And then on the next row, 144 minus 6 must be 138. The pattern tells me to knit 138. First, I'm going to take out this furthest marker, because I don't need that anymore. This is the marker I'm focused on, and I have this marker ready to go. I'm going to knit <coughs> 6 stitches shy of the next marker. And do a wrap and turn, yarn forward, slip, yarn back, slip, turn the work, yarn back, place the marker, and then knit to the end. And once you're six stitches from the end, you've finished the short rows. There are no more to do. And you can actually take these clippy markers out. Oh, I wanted to show you, these are the clippy markers that I'm using. These are actually fine to use, um, uh, markers like this. But because the actual yarn and needles used in the pattern, here it is, you can see it's fingering weight yarn. It's a much lighter yarn, and to me, these clippy markers feel a little clunky. I like to use these finer ones. These are coilless, coilless, that's such a crazy word, safety pins, so they won't catch the yarn. And these were given to me as a gift. I will try to find a link for you to um, where you can get these. Uh, but if you're watching this and you know where to get them, please contribute in the comments and let me know a good place to find markers like this, because those are nice because they unclip. <coughs> so this is our finished right triangle. Uh, all the short rows are finished. And Next up, we're going to work the lace row and change color. We are just about finished with the first triangle. We have one row left to do, and that's the lace row. So let's go ahead and take a look. Here is the lace row finished. Well, actually, three triangles finished. And the lace row is this decorative row with the holes in it. And it's worked with a yarn over and a knit two together. The yarn over is an increase, and the knit two together is a decrease. So you work this, and you, you alternate uh, those two stitches, and it keeps the stitch count exactly the same. So it's pretty, but it does not change your stitch count. So this is how we work this. The first stitch is slipped, and you always slip as if to purl, unless the pattern tells you otherwise. And the next stitch is knit, and then we start the lace repeat, which is yarn over, knit two together. Yarn over, knit two together. And I split the yarn there. And the yarn over is just sort of sort of wrapping, not a full wrap, wrapping the yarn on the right needle, like this, and knitting two together. And if you are a continental knitter, you're about to laugh at me, because this is not the way I normally knit. But if you hold the yarn in your left hand, you yarn over, and most people I see who knit uh, holding the yarn in their left hand use their index finger to hold the yarn over there while they work the next stitch. <laughs> that was good and awkward, not the way I normally knit. And you can see the yarn overs leave a hole in the work, and that's what we're after. So you work the yarn over, knit two together all the way across the row. And you'll end with a knit two together with two stitches left, and you'll just knit those two stitches. Now we are done with our first color. You can cut the yarn because we're ready to attach our second color. And this is how you do that. You always change color at the narrow end. 
So I'm going to put my needle in and take my new color and folding it over with about six inches of tail, I'll wrap the needle and pull it through and that is the new color attached. I uh, will knit up a few stitches. And what I like to do is to tie a knot. Tie a knot with the old tail and the new tail, and that will hold it secure. And I, uh, if you tie a nice tidy knot, you can just leave it there and weave in the ends. Weave in the ends as you go or when the whole shawl is finished. So as I'm knitting across, this is a yarn, this is a, a row you probably want to pay a little bit of attention to. You see the yarn over stitches aren't real stitches. There's no knot on the bottom. It's just uh, kind of a fakey stitch, but we treat it like a normal stitch. And to keep your stitch count correct, you want to be sure not to miss any of those yarn overs because they do, they can just kind of slide off the needle and it doesn't really look like anything's missing. So be sure to pay attention and get all of the yarn overs. We're going to knit all the way to the end on this first row in the new color, and we're also going to cast on the stitches. Cast on the stitches that gives us the offset. This here, the offset of each triangle. So I finished the lace row, I knit all the way across in the new color, and now I'm going to cast on these stitches. I'm just going to cast on a few, but the pattern will tell you to cast on 20. And the way we do this is hold the knitting in your right hand um, and the yarn in your left hand, kind of palm the yarn like this and put your thumb on the yarn and then flip and put the needle in that loop and let go. This is the way we cast on when we don't have two strands of yarn to work with, just one. And it's, uh, it works perfect for, it's not, it works perfect for things like this. It's not a very sturdy cast on, but it works good for this. So thumb on the yarn, flip, needle in that loop, tighten up. You want to tighten up just so it's tidy, not so that it's crazy tight. You want the, um, you want the little knots at the bottom to look nice and not be loose or anything, but you also don't want it to be impossible to work because you do have to, this is probably the slowest part of the whole, the whole shawl, is paying attention to getting these stitches just right. Sharper needles are helpful with this. So um, the backwards loop cast on stitches, they can tighten up really easily and <laughs> it makes it hard to get the needle in. So make sure you start by pulling them all the way down to the fullest part of the needle and then scooting them up to the taper and aim low, aim close to where the knot would be on that stitch. And it's really, it's normal knitting. It can just be hard to get your needle in there if you don't aim low. Or if you have a stitch on the tip of the needle and you pull it, it ends up becoming a much smaller stitch and it's hard to get your needle in there. So pull it down to the fullest part of the needle and then scoot it up without tightening it. And once you're past these few stitches, you're past them. You won't have to think about them again until the next triangle. And you'll see um, when you're working the backwards loop cast on, when you're knitting the first row with them, you'll see gaps in the yarn like this. Don't sweat it. A little bit of gap is fine. And it's because this cast on isn't very stable, um, it can tighten up like that. But then once, once it's all said and done, and especially after the scarf is washed and blocked, you can see that it looks fine now. No big gap. And we are actually working the next short row, row triangle right here. But it's worked exactly the same as the last one, so I don't have to show you all of it. Once you finish with all the triangles, 12 different triangles to make the beautiful shape of the whole shawl, you're ready to work the garter stitch border, which is just just regular plain knitting across all of the stitches that are on the needle. And you'll have little bits of yarn left over from each triangle, and it's really up to you how many rows you want to use. I, um, I kind of sw switched around with mine. 
there would be a color that I really loved, and so I'd do four rows of garter stitch border with that before I switch to the next color. Oh, the pattern tells you to work through the colors in the garter stitch border the same way you did in the whole shawl. What I chose to do was um, work backwards through. So my last triangle was purple, and I just continued up for my first row of garter stitch border as purple and then went backwards through all the colors. And I went, you know, I did between two and four rows of each color and it looks great. There's no rules for how you can, um, for how long you want to make that border, how many rows you want to do of each. But one little bit of advice that will help you determine how long you're going to make each one is it takes 19 feet to knit one row. That was, I'm, I'm sure yours will be close if it isn't exactly 19 feet. But if you just have a little bit of yarn left over, um, you can measure it to make sure you have 19 feet to make sure you can make it all the way across the row when you, uh, when you start. Because I think you have 376 stitches on the needle when you're, um, when you're doing the garter stitch border. Best to know if you're going to be able to finish a row before you start it. Anyway, I think that's everything for this tutorial. Many thanks to Skano for uh, letting us use their free pattern and their yarn in, in this tutorial. Good luck. <laughs>